Thank you, Alan. Good afternoon, everyone, and those on Zoom. Hope everyone had a very good week this week. I really didn't plan this with Alan, but he opened the, the hymn with um, actually the scripture I'm starting with today. So if you'd please turn to Psalm 103. Not a coincidence, I think it was inspired. <laughs> Psalm 103, and we'll start in verses 1, and we'll read through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all, all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, God provides so many benefits for us. He does so many good things for his people. You know, we don't have to look far. The problem with most of us in the Western cultures, I don't believe in God's church, but within the cultures that we live in, I think there's two things. One is most people don't look to God as the benefactor. They think it's me. I did this. Look what I did. Look at this empire I built. And two, they think they deserve more. I think it, it definitely does impact us to some degree, but I think if we're aware of it, we can realize that we go to God. He is our great giver. He's the great giver God, and he's the one who provides all of our, our benefits. He's forgiven our sins, and we'll see that more during the Passover season this year. We've been blessed to have joy and peace of mind, which I will tell you in this world is hard to find nowadays. What a blessing it is to have the joy of God in, our, in us and to have that peace of mind. I know people really struggle with that in this world today with all the turmoil that we have. We have a church family if we choose to attend and engage as a family. Um, some choose not to, some do. Everyone here today has a home that I know of with clean running water. They have daily food. And um, I know Lisa was reading something to me this morning. Our brethren in Nigeria are giving up their food to get to church on the Sabbath because food has become so expensive. So they're giving up a meal, their food for that day, just so they could travel to church to be in God's, to be in God's uh, church on the Sabbath day. I think that gives us a lot to think about when we decide to skip church for a Sabbath day for no good reason at all. I know there's good reasons to stay at home. But think about those brethren. The UN estimates that 25,000 people starve to death every single day. 828 million people go to bed hungry every night. You know, God has given us so many great benefits, but there is one benefit that I want to focus on today, and that's the benefit of healing. It's one of the great benefits that God gives his people in his church today. Let's turn to James 5, chapter 14 through 16. James 5, 14 through 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, the, of, the faith, of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So God has given that as one of the benefits of his church. Jesus Christ gave that to us as a benefit. God works through his ministry to serve his people and to act uh, through the act of healing and through the prayers of his servants. He doesn't make, make us go out and search anywhere else for that. He says the benefit is right here if we choose to take that benefit. And I believe that God's true ministry, although, you know, we all have flaws, all the people, but I think we're all trying to, to be righteous servants of God. And those faithful prayers of the righteous and faithful servant will avail, will avail much. They will avail much. You know, it's a humble it's a humble act when you go before God and ask him to intervene on behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ. It truly is a humble act to do that. 
We know that we, we have a close relationship. We all want to see that person healed. But in the end, we, we pray God's will be done. And for those that are new, the elders will then anoint you with oil in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving brother and that ultimate healer. He's the ultimate healer because he's, he's the one who's able to heal you. It's not, it's not the minister or anything else. It is Jesus Christ who died so that we could uh, be healed. He can heal us mentally, emotionally, physically, but most of all, spiritually. James says the prayer of faith will, he- will save the sick. That's what we just read. I've seen many people healed, including myself. The day my parents were baptized into the true church of God, they left me. I was playing with a bunch of kids. They left me with the church family. And they came back, and I was running a temperature of 108. And my mother rushed me home and threw me in a bathtub filled with ice and called the minister, and he came and anointed me. And by the next morning, I was healed. I was totally healed and playing outside with the kids again. And um, so I've seen that personally myself, and I've seen many others healed um, of, their, of their illnesses. I think that was their first trial when they came in the church the day they were baptized. So, you know, we should all remember that in all things, God's will be done. God's will needs to be asked to be done. And faith isn't defined by our will or desired outcome. It's not what we desire. It's what God desires in the end. You know, we have this tiny view of life just from our small experience And God has the bigger view of us. You know, his plan is not to keep any of us living in this flesh forever. That's not his plan. It's not that we survive forever in the the flesh. His plan is to help us to live eternally in the spirit. With that said, I don't want to discourage anyone from thinking that God doesn't heal today because he does. Again, God does heal his people today. When coming before God and asking for healing, we must believe that Jesus Christ is our great healer and that he has the power to heal anything, no matter what our problem is. And we need to remember that Jesus brought, uh, brought back many people from the dead. I mean, what an awesome thing. He didn't just heal them. He brought people back from the dead. And he's going to do that, too, in the end times. We'll see that through the two witnesses. And then we'll see it in the resurrection, too, when God brings back all the saints that have died in the faith at that time. What awesome power God has of healing. So next, let's turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. He did it in the past, and he's going to heal the two witnesses in the future. Now after, the, uh, three and a half, um, now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, speaking of the two witnesses, and they stood on their feet in great fear on those who saw them. So the world's going to fear that. God's power is going to bring two human beings that have been laying in the streets probably back to life, back from death. The last James tells us is that the prayers of the righteous person are greatly effective. They avail much, not a little, but much. You know, we all must be striving to be faithful and righteous followers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're doing that, not only do we help ourselves, but we help others. We're helping others in in the faith, and we're helping this world by doing that. We need to become like our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we ask for prayers, and we go to the ministry and the elders, and we ask God to intervene as our healer and our physician, he already knows our diagnosis. He knows what's wrong with us. So maybe we don't know at that time, but we fall on our knees. We know something's wrong with us, and we go to God. He already knows what the problem is. The doctors don't know what the problem is until they analyze us, right? God already knows what the problem is, and he has the ability to fix that. Next, let's turn to Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. We read, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, 
and by his stripes we are healed. Which e with each lash upon Jesus Christ, he knew and was taking that for every one of us so that we could be healed physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He knew what he was doing. That was the gift, the great gift that Jesus Christ was giving each and every one of us to be healed completely. You know, sometimes I think in our society today, our reliance on the medical industry may, may take our focus off the primary great healer, Jesus Christ. I know a lot of times people feel something, they run straight to the doctor. I think if we have the time and it's not an emergency, I mean, I think as Christians we would want to go to our knees and ask God first to heal us. I think that should be our first step, is to ask God to heal us first and put it before him. He is the great healer. Again, he's the one who knows what's going on in our bodies. He could heal whatever's going wrong with us at that time, and he knows that. And I'm not, certainly not saying don't go to the doctor. I think um, we, need to, we need doctors today. His great sacrifice for us should be in our thoughts and our studies, and it should be drawing us closer to him, especially before the Passover season. Jesus took it upon him, himself as a selfless act through the pain and suffering of his, and his death so that we could have that complete healness, healing. You know, it's just so 21st century for us to just go straight to that doctor and make Jesus Christ that afterthought. We have drugs that mask a lot of things. We have operations that fix things, and, and, that, and there's certainly not anything wrong with that. And I'm absolutely not saying don't go see a doctor. I sure do, and I want their diagnosis and their expertise. They're highly educated. But what I'm saying is Christ is a supreme physician, They are physicians, but they're mere men. They make mistakes as well. Jesus Christ never makes a mistake. The anointing for our healing is a great act of faith, and it's not minimized at all by using a doctor, unless we put the doctor first. Unless we have more faith in the doctor than we have Jesus Christ. That's the only time it's minimizing that. Being anointed is a very personal act. It's an act of worship of God. It's a choice that each of us make at times of illness. In James 5, it states to call on the elders of the church. If one doesn't believe that he's in, he or she is in the right church of God, I could understand why you wouldn't go to the elders because that wouldn't be the true church. But if you do believe that you are in the true church of God, I think that you can take up that benefit that God has offered you. But again, it's a very personal choice. So how do we anoint? So anointing is not very complex. What we do is um, we pray over the person. We use just a drop of olive oil, and we put it on our thumb or our finger, and we place it on your forehead. Then we place hands over the person and ask God, God's healing, but in the end we'll ask that God's will be done We do that for the love of Jesus Christ, for the love of each and every one of you. But we take that example given to us in Mark 5. So let's, next let's turn to Mark 5. One of the rulers of the synagogue uh, named Jairus came to Jesus and fell at his feet. So we're going to start in verse 23, Mark 5, verse 23. My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jairus knew that laying out of hands was part of, of the act of healing. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood of 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was, not, and was no better, but rather grew worse. So to show, I mean, even biblically, Human beings make mistakes. They can make mistakes. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in herself 
or in, in himself, that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging around you, around you and you say, who touched me? There's just so many people. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came to the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Brethren, this is why you trouble the teacher further. Let's read on. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. He wants us to believe. In other words, don't lose heart. Believe that he can do this thing. Believe that he loves us enough that he'll do the best for us, that he wants the best outcome. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and uh, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and, and saw a tumult or an uproar in the crowd and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. And there'll be those that will ridicule healing in the world especially, but maybe even in the church. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And, and they were overcome by a great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know, should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. I just love the fact that Jesus Christ is so loving. Not only did he bring her back to life, but he wanted her to have something to eat. <laughs> so he was concerned about her hunger, and she'd probably been sick and in bed for so many days. What a loving God that we have. You know, we see in both of these instances the healing, that faith and belief are really important in, in that healing process. You know, we must go to God in faith, even if it's as, as small as a mustard seed. You know, faith is, is something that grows with time. It's not an instant thing. It needs to grow with time, and each of us are at a different part of our life where some have more faith than others because either time or experiences and things have helped us grow in that, in that, in that vein. He doesn't say that it has to be this mountainous faith that we have or I'm going to heal you. I mean, I think sometimes we forget that the disciples of Christ and that these people who followed him were, Christ's ministry was only three and a half years. So how long, I mean, how much faith can a person get in three and a half years? I mean, to me, three and a half years is a very short period of time. It might be long during the tribulation, but I think... For most of our life, I think three and a half years is a very short period of time. They were all babes in Christ, really. Next, in, in Mark chapter 16, 15 through, through 18. Mark chapter 15, or 16, I'm sorry. Mark 16, 15 through 18. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues, and they will take up serpents, and they will drink, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not and by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So that was a part of what the disciples were supposed to do. They were supposed to go out healing people. You know, the oil that's used in the anointing 
represents God's Holy Spirit, his power. Yet it's not the oil that heals. Again, it's not the oil, it's not the person. In James 5, we read that the Lord raises the sick. So it's very clear that the Lord raises the sick. It's none other than our great healer and physician, Jesus Christ, that really does all the the heavy lifting there, right? You know, seeking God for healing is a beautiful act, and it's an act of worship, and it's an act of faith. If we seek God's healing, we should keep in mind that we need to do our part as well. So if we're out smoking a pack of cigarettes and asking God to um, heal our, our CPOD or COPD, CO, COPD, I mean, God's not going to do that, I don't believe, unless we are at least trying to overcome what we're doing. If we're eating, you know, we have clogged arteries and we're, you know, eating fatty meats, I think we need to start taking reflection on what we're doing in life if we want to be healed. So we have have to at least be showing God that we are taking an effort to do these things. I know that people have struggles, but I think if we're all trying, I know many of us have things to overcome, all of us do, Um, I think God honors that. We need to keep turning to him and repenting, and that's what the Passover is all about. That's why it's repeated, because none of us are perfect, and we all do fall from time to time. That's why it's annual. You know, we must ask the question, or we might ask the question, what should, we, uh, what should we be anointed for? So a lot of people have asked, okay, can I be anointed for this? Can I be anointed for that? I think the Bible gives us um, a template. It gives us an outline. It talks about some amazing healings. I mean, Jesus Christ himself healed the blind, the crippled, lepers. And I know today I've seen in God's church, I've seen people healed of fevers, flus, depression, cancer, back problems, emotional problems. So there's a whole list of things that, that you can be, be healed from. I personally haven't seen uh, someone who is blind or, or a leper be healed, not personally, but I know that God can do it. I know God has the power to do that. And I think as uh, we get closer to the end times, I think we're going to see some miraculous healings. I think we will see those things. And we need to make sure that it's by the right spirit, though. So we can't be fooled by the spirit because we are warned of that as well. You know, anointing is, that import, is an important act of worship. And it was from the New Testament church as Jesus himself performed so many healings. I mean, you go throughout the New Testament and there's just so many examples of that. I don't think you can go through Matthew without seeing it. I don't know. I just... I was noticing the other day, it's, it's everywhere I was looking, he was healing somebody. And uh, it's just, just amazing the compassion that he has on people. But anointing is a part of Jesus' instruction to the church. The church is instructed to support people in that. A representation of the olive tree. Um, I was actually reading a little bit about this online, and I thought it was, it was very interesting. They said that olive trees are widely planted throughout Israel. I think most of us know that. The oil was used and still is used today for medicinal purposes, cook, cooking, beautification, and fueling lamps, as well as, as symbolic of healing. These olive trees flourish in rocky and dry places and have survived for thousands of years, still producing good fruit. They're survivors. They produce good fruits after even thousands of years, so after a long lifetime, they're still producing good fruit. You know, God's Holy Spirit is likened to olive oil, and it helps us to survive through tough times. Those rocky places, the droughts in life, the floods, the winds. So that's what God's Holy Spirit will do for us. You know, through our personal challenges, we can become stronger. Those floods, those winds, those droughts, those times when we have infirmities, you know, even, even take, for instance, in our, in our human bodies, when we get sick and we have the flu and we recuperate, it actually strengthens your immune system. That's the same as the trials that we have. It's like weightlifting in your, inside your body. So you're doing some weightlifting and it's making you actually healthier in the long run. 
There is always a time where we might not recover. Or we, we will get old someday. But until that time, it's actually strengthening our immune system. We can get stronger by going through that. And again, that's the same thing that God's doing with the trials that we have in, in life, that resistance. It builds that immune system. And a lot of times we have the tendency to focus uh, on what's happening to us right now. I mean, when we're in pain, I mean, we feel it. I mean, I'll be honest, I hate pain. <laughs> I certainly don't like it. I'm uncomfortable with it. But, you know, God uses that as a catalyst for each and every one of us. And I think he wants, us, he wants to get our attention from time to time. But we need to focus on what, what God has for us on that challenge. We need to look at the long game. And we should ask God to help make that a little clearer to us. I think sometimes we don't know what we're going through. I certainly don't know why I'm going through some of the things that I go through at the time. But God often reveals them a little bit later and sometimes way after the trial or the challenge. Not, all, not everything is a, is a trial. Everything can be a challenge or a trial. But, but it's good to ask God what he wants us to learn from this. What lessons can we learn from what's wrapped up in the gauze bandages that we're all wrapped up in, right? What, what lesson is wrapped up in that? You know, God always knows what's best for us and every one of us individually in our times and in our life. He knows what's best for us. He's interested in bringing you and me to that ultimate destiny and glory. Time is something God uses to help us learn. And it takes time for us to grow, to grow in faith. And it can open our eyes to something that we didn't see through the challenge early on. So when people are battling through maybe a, a long illness, maybe we don't see something right away, but it might take some time, and that's why he's not healing us right away. It's not that we're doing something wrong, we just don't see it at the time. And he's teaching us a little patience too, I'm sure. You know, there's a place that God wants to bring us to individually, and he alone, he alone can skillfully bring us there. Next, let's turn to Mark chapter 9 to see just a few of the many healings of Jesus Christ. Mark 9, 17 through 29, we'll go through. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who was, has a mute spirit, and wherever it, it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast, cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring, bring him to me. And they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming in, at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father and the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsing him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Again, Jesus' great compassion. He took him by the hand. He didn't just stand there looking over him, or he took him... The, the young child by the hand. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I mentioned something uh, the, the last time I, I spoke. Christ gave us a hint here. Hint, hint. Fasting. Prayer and fasting can bring us to another level. Prayer and fasting can bring us to a different level. 
The disciples were unsuccessful in doing what Christ appointed them to do. He wanted them to go out and heal, cast out demons and to heal. And they could not do that, but they would be able to do it. Christ gave us an instruction. That's for our example today as well. Prayer along with fasting together both is what rebuked that spirit. Fasting has the ability to draw us closer to the realization of how much we need God. It changes our mindset from arrogance to humility. When we feel that, fr- fr- that fragile part of our body start to ache a little bit, maybe a little stomach growling, maybe that headache, we start to realize how physical we are and how much we need God. It brings us to that next level. It helps us set our priorities in our head. You know, we can make our challenges a blessing, and we can be that encourager through our infirmities. We don't have to be that champion complainer, all right? We want to be the encourager. We want to be the prayer giver for others. So even when you have infirmities, there are things you can do. You can send a card. You can also give somebody a call and give them kind words or send them a, a, an inspiring email or something. You know, it's, it's precious when we, when we do these things. It's precious in God's eyes when we do these for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can't be wasting our time on negativity. You know, let's be nice to one another before we don't have any more nice left. No more time left. Let's love others before we have no more time left to love. Next, let's turn to Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. I'm sorry, just Ephesians 5, 15, let's start there. Let's go. I think we'll go with 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We need to redeem the time. I think we're all aware we live in evil times. But we need to be redeeming the time. We can't just watch the time go by. We shouldn't be clock watchers. What if God isn't healing us? What if we're suffering a long-term illness or receive a diagnosis that's truly serious? We get anointed and we even have righteous prayers. for, And we do. Maybe we have righteous prayers from, from people who are close to God. We ask other people to pray for us. We put in announcements. We've been anointed. Does that mean that God doesn't love us or perhaps he's angry with us? The answer is definitely no and no. That is not how God operates. We have a loving God. He will always love you. Each and every one of us are the object of his affection. This is the whole reason. We are the purpose for the whole earth existing children and his family. He'll use our circumstances to be glorified and praised when he accomplishes good things through us because you're going to be showing the world what God can do with that different attitude, being a true Christian, how we react in a situation differently than people who don't have God's Holy Spirit, how we have a bold joy and peace inside of us that nobody else can have in this world without God's Holy Spirit. You now, God has given us, a, a, his, he's revealed his great plan to his people, and he's promised you and me comfort even in those circumstances where we're suffering through an infirmity. Next, let's turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. Through four. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble so that we, that's the reason, God tells us so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That's the reason. Sometimes when we go through it, if we're looking for an answer, God gave us 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 5. He's telling us when we suffer these things, it's so that 
when we have these, these troubles, that we can comfort others as he comforted us. So those mature Christians can share that with the, with the new babes in Christ and with those around them as, as good examples. You know, it's often hard, and we may question a trial, but that's because of our limited experience, and it's because it is happening to us. Like I said, you know, pinch, pinch, you feel that, right? It's happening to us. We know, and it's hard sometimes, but God will help us through it. Let's be... I mean, let's be real. None of us love the pain of a trial. None of us love that pain. But God sees things differently. He sees, sees them from a wiser, loving, caring, and a long-term view for us. He's our great and loving healer, and he's filled with mercy and compassion. Romans 8 is the sum, the whole amount, the aggregate. And it's the last scripture that I have today. So let's turn to Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, we're predestined to be conformed to change in our illnesses, whether healed or not, are to work in each of us to draw us closer in a relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ.